Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will be discussing the importance of public media institutions with our special guests, John Abbott, President and CEO of GBH in Boston, Adrian Farewell, General Manager of Arizona PBS, and Chris Turpin, Chief of Staff at National Public Radio. So thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. Now seems an apt time to discuss the future of public media. So uh, I'd love to start uh, with uh, GBH, just because your predecessors, John, really invented this field and led it. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you see the past and the future, where we are? Are we, have we achieved that vision or, or uh, do we get an incomplete? Well, it's a, a privilege to be with you, Mark, and with everyone who's watching with Adrian and Chris. Um, I, you know, for me, and I've been in this field now for over 30 years, uh, it is, uh, I think, a constant journey to meet the uh, aspirations that were laid out for what was then public radio and public television, and we've come to call public media. Uh, but I think that uh, I'd accept an incomplete, but I, uh, I think that if my predecessors uh, were to look at what public media has evolved to and become and the manner in which we've adopted uh, um, the new platforms and the new technologies and stayed true to our mission, focused on our purpose and imagined how we continue to meet the challenge of being essential and valuable in communities across this country. I think there has been tremendous work done and great pro promise and, pro and progress made. Uh, but as we know, as with any social enterprise, there is always work to do as uh, our environment evolves. Our challenge is to keep evolving with that environment, consistent with the mission, consistent with our purpose, evolving our services, whether it's in journalism, in education, children's programming, uh, and in topical areas where we recognize communities across the country and citizens in the country uh, really yearn for the chance to learn more and to be engaged with the critical issues of the day. I think that's true of NPR, I think that's true of PBS, and each of them has grown in their role and import with the American people. So we are constantly involved in this dialogue uh, uh, surrounding in this country, surrounding the idea of private business being able to fulfill all of our needs. Yet public media, Adrian, when you when you look at what we're talking about, and you're you're a resident at ASU, a, a great state educational institution, uh, public media is part of this dialogue. Why can't public media just go away and be suppl uh, supplanted by uh, private businesses that also are media businesses? I think, Mark, that that's a great question. And uh, to John's point, to John's earlier point, the great thing about public media is the fact that we're able to fill gaps that, say, your commercial or business entities are not are not necessarily able to do. Um, and I think we proved that over the course of 2020 with the pandemic. Uh, when the pandemic hit, education became a question for our K-12 students, for our colleges and universities. And it was, how do we deliver the same level of services uh, without causing some type of gap uh, in those services to those who need them most? And I think at that time, public media in every way stepped up. Um, we changed our programming to meet the needs of the K-12 students. I mean, we, we ran full day schedules of K-12 programming. We changed out programming to meet curriculum needs. Um, from there, public media came together to utilize the technology that we had um, at our fingertips, quite frankly, to be able to transmit different signals to our, to different, our state students. And so I think one of the reasons, Mark, is that we are fully accessible by most every American citizen, right? So you don't have to have um, a satellite. You don't necessarily have to have cable, a cable television subscription. Um, for us, it's about access, it's about equity, um, and it's really about our mission in education. And we were able, as a public media entity, to fill those gaps without, almost without incident, to be honest with you. And I think that, that we, we proved at a time when we were most necessary that public media is relevant, it's timely, um, and, and I honestly think that we, we 
we regenerated what our business model really should look like with public media, to be honest with you. And you were able to make a commercially irrational decision, right? I mean, there yeah. was no revenue line that was attached to education for youngsters, right? When, when Sesame Street started, there was no revenue line uh, or promise of, of success, um, but it was done out of a commitment to civil society. So Chris, when you look at, at shaping your programs, how does shaping your programs differ um, in a public media setting from in a setting in which uh, commercial um, uh, considerations uh, really must dictate um, how a business functions? Um, that's a very good question. I think the first thing I'd say is actually just to amplify this notion of the uniqueness of our network, which I think is a very important part of what we do. One of the phenomena, certainly on the radio side and also I think on the television side, has been the growth of public media newsrooms over the last 20, 25 years. I was lucky enough to hear Susan Stenberg um, in one of our 50th uh, anniversary events the other day say that one of the things that she is proudest about now as she looks at public radio is the strength of public radio newsrooms. It didn't used to be the case. And that's because they have come to fill a void that has been left by commercial media. As the newspapers, uh, you know, we talk a lot about news deserts, we talk about ghost newspapers. Public media newsrooms are filling that void with aggressive, uh, cutting edge journalism. You used to go to public radio when you wanted the soft feature about the Bratwurst Festival in Wisconsin. Now you go to it because you wanna, you wanna know what's happening in the sausage making in, in the capital. And that's what public media is doing. That's not a, you know, that's a decision of filling a need, filling a need in our society, filling a void. And then on the, the other side of that, I would say from the NPR perspective, if you want to look at it across the spectrum, NPR maintains 18 international bureaus. I can tell you that is not a commercial proposition. And I'm sure on the PBS side, they, uh, my colleagues would say the same thing. Uh, you, if you were making a profit or loss decision, you would not keep two reporters in China. I can, I can tell you that. But look at the pandemic. What that allowed us to do was we had a reporter in Wuhan and then we were able to follow the dots all the way down to the national level and all the way down, right down to, to communities across America where, pub, where public radio is heard. And you had deeply reported stories being told by people with deep connections to those communities. And that to me is what I think makes what we do completely and utterly unique on both the TV and the radio sides of our business. The other thing that came out of that, that was the interview that you were referring to with uh, Nina, uh, Nina Totenberg, Susan Sandberg, and uh, Linda Wertheimer, I, I believe. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about that is the, the fact that um, women who had been sidelined were suddenly, uh, suddenly had voice. And we're seeing the same thing with the Black Lives Matter movement and this, uh, this focus on diverse voices, whether it's um, it's Asian Americans, um, women, uh, African Americans, um, uh, Native Americans, we're we're starting to see that by um, by listening, by um, providing the same platforms that white men have had for for so long, we start to open up windows into this country that previously uh, we just, you know, as, as a mass public, we're not exposed to. So in, a, in, in, in fact, the dialogue surrounding issues that all citizens experience was tilted. John, how do you retilt now? You know, now we have, we've been talking about radio and television, but it's no longer radio and television. It's basically the internet and it's everything. How do we retilt so that the, what, what we can actually be exposed to is a more full picture of America. Well, I think in part, Mark, what you're talking about is not only the work we do and how we do the work, but also where we are with the work and recognizing that to meet our ambitions, our mandate, to meet our challenge, to meet this moment, we need to work and make sure uh, and attend to having our content available on all of the digital platforms with uh, really embracing the new formats that um, YouTube or Twitter or 
TikTok are going to afford us. And at GBH, we're experimenting. We have a group called the Emerging Platforms Initiative that works with all of our content creators and basically helps kind of work back on where we know the audience is and how we can be attentive to how we produce to those platforms, attentive to what audiences are expecting. And you're expe you're, you need to expand who creates, right? And we also yeah. need to focus on uh, the circumstances of who creates, but who's behind the camera, who's in front of the camera, the range of our topics, and make sure that we are fully including and representing this extraordinary range of perspectives and talents that really reflect the entire country. And for us, uh, that not only means in the, the makers, the circumstances of who is making the work and whose voice is behind and guidance is behind that work, but also, for example, for a series like Nova, which we produced, who is in front of the camera? How are we representing scholars, policymakers, those with the knowledge to guide the American conversation? And we want to make sure that we have the full range and breadth and depth of that talent in this country, because all of the country, all of this nation needs to see itself and hear itself in our work in public media. And I think, if, if I may, Mark, I, I think that that's one of the, what John just touched on, and that is the fact that not only creating uh, content for diverse platforms and being intentionally strategic there, we also have to be intentionally strategic in who gets the job to produce these things. We have to be intentionally strategic about who's the voice, who's the face. Um, and, and I don't think that, I think with awareness um, comes intentionality and that is where I believe public media is at this point. We are very much aware um, and so now we are sitting around the tables, really trying to be intentional and strategic about all of those dots connecting for us um, in terms of who's producing what content. Because let's face it, we know that um, not just in, in this country, but worldwide, people want their content when they want it, how they want it, where they want it, um, what devices they want it on. So when we talk about um, emerging technologies and emerging voices, Absolutely. Um, we also have to talk about the fact that those voices and those um, faces may not look like um, ours and we have to be accepting of that. And with, with there's a paradigm shift, I believe, going on in, in public media right now. And because to, to make any changes, those who sit in the seats have to recognize and be aware that change is needed, right? Um, so change can't happen if you're not willing to move forward. And, I, and I'm, I'm just so very proud to be a part of a, a sector that is really trying to be intentional about where we're headed with diversity and equity and inclusion, um, not just for programming and content, but also uh, for individuals and devices. And, you know, it's, we are definitely a, a group that um, is, is evolving with the time. So when you're moving to different voices being presented, different people doing the presenting, different content creators, different editors, different business managers, people are making the decisions. None of this attaches to a revenue stream, right, Chris? So how do you, how do you make the revenue work, right? If you're going to cover people who don't necessarily have buying power, and therefore advertising is not going to be targeted on them. And most of the internet is, is done by selling personally accessible data to advertisers, right? How does that actually function? Are, are you still so dependent on uh, individual donations? You know, if, if people aren't watching the live uh, broadcast and instead of looking at podcasts, how do fundraisers work, right? How, how does that all function? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of things there. I mean, the first I would say is there are always some things that are easier to monetize than other things. And, and that is why one of the virtues is, is that we have sort of a multifaceted revenue streams, right? I mean, public media is supported by individual membership, which is a Brit who came to this country, I still think is one of the most remarkable things that pay, people pay for something they can get for free. Uh, is philanthropy, obviously, and sponsorship. But I, I would also say there's a couple of interesting assumptions there that I think, you know, what we, we can challenge a little bit in, in, in interesting ways. So we have a series, um, one of our most successful podcasts is called Invisibilia. Um, it's been out for several years. And this year, the, the uh, former host stepped down 
and two new hosts stepped in who are people of color, young people of color who worked on the show previously, and uh, we made them into hosts. And, uh, you know, they, they, they wanted to be hosts of the show, they had a vision for it. And the new season is just out. And if you look at that show, what's, it's both familiar and different. The lens has changed in ways that are really interesting in the way that it views our society and the way that it views what's going on in our society. But at the same time, the program is very familiar. So if, so if, you, if you love the first three seasons or four seasons of Invisibilia, you'll love this season of Invisibilia. But at the same time, you're getting something that is subtly and importantly different. And I think there is this notion to think that if we're going to reach different audiences, it poses all these problems around sponsorship, around monetization. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of what our research shows is that actually, uh, when you actually start thinking about your story choice, which comes back to the point that Adrian and John are making about who's in front of the camera, who's in front of the microphone, who's behind the microphone, you actually find an audience with the programs you're already doing. Many of our podcasts have very diverse audiences, we've discovered, and that's because of being really thoughtful and mindful about trying to repoint them to appeal to a broader audience that's more in tune with our overarching mission. I think you're kind of uh, straddling the fence though here. You're, say, you're saying uh, two things simultaneously, and I think that they are in opposition, but also simultaneously true. New audiences mean new viewers and new funders in many respects, right? You're, you're, you're awakening interest amongst people who have not necessarily have the same uh, need address, their need address in the past, but now their needs are being addressed. So when you're engaging them, you can, you can engage them in funding. So there are new funders, but, but your methods can also be, uh, can harken back to tried and true methods, right, Adrian? You're, you're on mute. Yes, you would think after a year, I would know how to unmute, but. but... <laughs> I've had a lot of practice, um, but but the the response to that is this: um, I don't I don't necessarily see us as straddling the fence because the issue is that we create new content. So with new content, absolutely comes new users, and then it also opens up a funding stream for us. So you figure out what works. What we didn't do in public media for quite some time, Mark, was really pay attention to ratings and statistics and data and analytics. Um, now we use those things to really help drive business decisions. And so when we talk about uh, opening up revenue streams because of our digital capabilities now and our digital assets, uh, we do that not only by opening up different content and different platforms, we do that by looking at the numbers, how many people are watching, when, what times are they watching, how long do they watch, what are they watching. Um, and so what are they listening to? How long are they listening to this podcast? What types of topics do they enjoy? So, so we are learning in public media, Mark, to really dive into the analytics. And NPR and PBS both do a really good job of providing those databases um, for us so that we're able to, as general managers, make those types of decisions based on uh, make those funding stream decisions based on what the data tells us. Um, when should be we should be airing certain programs, whether it's for the radio side or um, the television side, or when should we be posting certain um, information or content on the digital side? And digital, th this is when we talk about digital. It's not just about posting uh, sound bites and posting bits of content in chunks. It's about the engagement. So digital is a complement to whatever it is we are doing on the radio and TV side. So when we talk about diversifying the funding stream and diversifying the audiences, it's because this then becomes, they complement each other. And so that's, that's how we're starting to look at it at Arizona PBS in terms of what sh how should we be fundraising for this particular platform? It is not one size fits all. And so I think that using the data and analytics, which is something public media never really cared about that because to your point, we don't necessarily um, worry so much about commercialism, right? Um, but we do have to, for us, those donations pay for a lot of us, our programming. So we have to be cognizant of those numbers. And by using the, the data, we're, they're helping to drive business and funding decisions nowadays. 
I think you're referencing John's earlier point about the, the, the vision really being one of addressing the audience, right? Of, so that vision, uh, the technology changes, but it's addressing the audience. Uh, we just completed two polls. Um, uh, one poll was about uh, the balance of, of interest in programs. And I'm quite surprised. It's very balanced. About the same number of people uh, view public media for arts and entertainment, education, news and politics, and talk shows and podcasts. Now, this audience is a little bit older, so we didn't get any votes for, for children programming, um, uh, uh, children's programming and, um, and governmental affairs. Um, but not politics. Um, but it, it was incredibly balanced. So you end up with these different aspects of civil society uh, being covered, entertainment being also uh, part of it. And then we also asked about funding and 64% of individuals uh, felt that government funding was absolutely critical and as well as public funding. And, and most of the balance of, of individuals uh, felt uh, very strongly that uh, in addition to that, um, uh, that sort of government uh, pu uh, private mix was absolutely essential. So John, as, as you go forward and you're, you're trying to make ends meet and, and balance here, um, how are you at GBH, and you've just rebranded, right? How, how are you at, at GBH pursuing that engagement so that your revenue streams meet your ambitions? because you also need to expand. I mean, that's what the rebranding was about, is expanding. So you need revenue to, to fund that. How do you look at that? How are you going about that? Well, I loved that Adrian used the word intentional. And I think that that is uh, gonna be a kind of centerpiece of our strategy over the next five to 10 years. Uh, intentionality with regards to uh, what we are creating and where we are present with that work. And so to this issue of strategy, and Adrian got it a little bit, as did Chris, uh, I, my sense right now, if you look at our contributor base, it's over 4 million Americans contribute to public media. I loved how Chris said, you know, some, you know, amazed as he is that it's something that somebody does voluntarily. We're the largest um, voluntarily supported cultural educational institution in this country. And yet we know to your point, Mark, we have to keep growing it. And I believe that if we are intentional in reaching new generations of audiences uh, in the places where they are finding in the rhythm of their lives, the places where they're embracing content and relevant and worthwhile, fulfilling experiences, staying connected to their communities, that if we are where they are, as Adrian said, and we are meeting a need and having those revelatory moments that frankly, they call them driveway moments with public radio, right? But all those moments where somebody says, gosh, I can't believe that someone took the time to really present that issue to me in that way. Uh, same thing with children's programs. I think if we are part of people's lives and we are meeting them where they are, we will continue to create a case with them for their voluntary support. And Chris is right. We're going to have to invent new ways uh, to be in front of them uh, and to, to ask for their support. But I think that notion of intentionality will be rewarded by a, a, those in a community who recognize that to bind a community, to strengthen a community, we need a public forum. We need a resource whose mission and purpose is built to be strengthening of the fabric of how we hold together as a community and as a country. And I think if we are intentional in the work we do and communicate that case well enough, I am absolutely certain that the majority of Americans recognize, as your poll illustrates, that the majority of Americans recognize that what we have to do in this country is connect, bind with one another, understand one another, and invest in the resources that we need to make sure that we're connecting with each other. And public media in communities in every part of this country is at the center of committing to that kind of coherence, that weaving together of people and ideas and, and really empowering communities. Well, could you give and us- That's what um, makes us special, John. That, 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 so Mark, going back to your earlier question about um, you know, public media filling a gap and, you know, how do we, how to, basically, how do we rebound from, from the pandemic? 
But, but what John just said sums it up for me in that we are able to respond to our community in ways that um, other media outlets are unable to do so. We are, you know, you can, saying you're connected to your community is one thing, but actually being a part of the community, feeling the needs of the community, rolling up your sleeves shoulder to shoulder and really bringing forth those issues. I say that public media, we're the convener. We're the convener of all of those community ideas, those community problems. Are we, are we helping to solve them? I don't know, but we bring the right people to the table and we, give, we provide a forum for those problems to be resolved within those communities. And I mean, I, I think that our donors, our membership base recognize the fact that we live, work and play in the communities that we serve. And so we undoubtedly want to make those better. I love the, the combination of points, thinking with the audience and redefining who the audience is to be much more inclusive, much more expansive. Um, the point that you made so eloquently, uh, Adrian, in terms of analytics and the importance of data informing um, those choices and the, the points that you all contributed in terms of, of thinking beyond the incentives that are provided by standard business models uh, to constantly reinvent. I mean, that's really, it really harkens back to the origins of, of this particular area because you had to invent out of nothing a new place for yourself. And so you're continuing to reinvent. So let's go around the table um, uh, one time since we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, let's start with, uh, with Chris um, and then John and then uh, Adrian will give you the last word. In terms of the future, um, as, as you shape this facility, this amazing facility, um, how do you deal with the fact that um, funding for public media is, uh, government funding is always under attack. Um, revenue, um, uh, you know, in, in, in these models where so much is dependent on uh, selling personal information and, and um, breaching privacy, um, how do you compete and, and how do you see this evolving, uh, Chris, particularly with radio becoming less of a factor, the actual radio, the broadcast signal becoming less of a factor? How do you move forward? What do you see the future evolving toward? What do you see a convergence amongst public media entities? First, I, I wouldn't write off radio too quickly. It's turned out to be a very robust medium over the past uh, past century, and I think has some it has some pretty good life in it yet. I think 88% of Americans use uh, radio monthly. So, you know, it's a pretty vital medium. Um, I mean, I think we're lucky in public medium that we in public radio that, you know, we do have a diversity of revenue sources. I think we're going to need to be really creative and thoughtful about then how we build on those sources to the point that John made. But the, the truth is, if we're meeting our audiences where they are and we're engaging them, the opportunity is huge. I'll give you one example of this. Let's take podcasting, for example. We have, we know we have at NPR about 15 million podcast uh, listeners a week. And we know from our research, very few of those are actually members of public radio stations and actually are really radio listeners. So, and we know that they have deep affinity of a different kind. Community is not just geographic now, community can be around your areas of interest. So one question would be, and something that we're exploring and something I know John's talked about, about a lot, it's, you know, how do, we, how do we take those listeners, those users of our products and turn them into the equivalent of members, give them the same relationship that a member in say Arizona in Phoenix has with the PBS station that Adrian runs, that give them the same relationship because they happen to like planning money. And how do we do that in a way that bolsters the local national partnership that is at the heart of everything we do. And I think, you know, those are the sort of problems that we need to work through. But I think you can see the opportunity there. You know, there's 4 million, as, as John said, there's about 4 million people who give to public radio. 
That's 13 million people sitting there using our products every week who we're not exploiting. And that's just not exploiting, but not, and not contributing to public, radio, public media. And so the opportunity, and that's just one example, the opportunity to grow revenue sources is large. And more to the point, the opportunity to grow our audience is large. One of the things that I always notice is that public media is a word of mouth medium. We have never really marketed ourselves. Of course, the larger we get, the more people talk to each other and it makes it possible to get larger. But we also, you know, I think when we actually start making the case for ourselves, getting out there, getting in front of people who don't use us all the time, they'll find things that they love about what it is that we do. And that's whether they're watching Tiny Desk concerts, watching Nova documentaries, or coming back and realizing that all things considered doesn't sound like it did 10 years ago. So, you know, I'm very bullish about our opportunities in revenue and our opportunities in audience. Wow, that's, that's just so exciting. Basically, you're saying there's more undiscovered cu country out there than, than that, that has been, um, been inhabited, right? I mean, it's basically the new frontier and being able to, to look at interactivity as this uh, wonderful world of opportunity. The other thing that, that works in your favor is that we just completed a poll and 87% of respondents said that they trust public media more than commercial media, John. So you have this well of trust, right? And and Adrian, you at the Cronkite School, and just you know, you're right in the center of trust, right? So John, um, what is what is your answer for you for your future as you're rebranding and you're and you're evolving this renowned uh, network that you have at GBH? Well, I do. Uh, thank you for flagging, and I'm grateful for that third question. Because uh, alongside Chris's observation, I would put trust at the center of it. Uh, for nearly 18 years, uh, we've done some polling for PBS and illustrated that uh, public television is among the most trusted institutions in this country. And I think that's needed more than ever. But I think for people like Adrian and Chris and me and our colleagues across the country in every community, the centerpiece of our relationship with the audience. And, and our relevance and our resonance is grounded in that trust. So every, that should be our North Star. How are we, as Adrian was saying, attentive to the expectations and aspirations of that audience? How are we accountable to our communities and to our audience in such a way that they say, I have to commit to investing in the institutions and the resources in my community that are going to make a difference, not just for me and my family, but for the teachers in my community, from the people I share my community with, because we, we may have new questions in front of us after how we build this community, but in public media, we have a resource, as Adrian says, that's convening us around those questions. And the only other thing I'd say to build on Chris's point is, when you think about podcasting as an on-demand medium, and now streaming as an on-demand video medium, it is a very powerful, our value to the American people has gone up exponentially because we can do something on a two i used to <laughs> used to wrestle with premiering an american experience on a monday night last night we premiered a really uh strong program on uh the legacy of billy graham well it premiered last night the next hour airs tonight and yet for the next weeks for months friends will tell friends this word of mouth issue and it will still and and so the ability to access this deep library is extraordinarily powerful and far greater than it was in the days of linear television or radio. My favorite moment last week was when my 25-year-old daughter said to me, hey, dad, there was this uh, tiny desk concert that was really cool. And have you ever heard of this artist, dad? And here was a tiny desk concert from like months ago that she had got clued into by a friend of hers in her 20s. And she, all of a sudden, what I was part of was cool to her. So she goes, dad, you gotta check out Tiny Desk Concerts. So that notion of a library, that, that asynchronous issue of content on demand is the most profound shift in a way for all of us, which enhances our value to people in meeting the moments in their lives where they're curious. Well, I think back to the work that Cronkite did and Safer did in covering the Vietnam War which actually brought points that were being made by um, Ali and King uh, back to, um, to the general public, right? Um, the doubts that were expressed very often out of non-white audiences for a, 
um, for a war that America was engaged in in Asia uh, during the Vietnam era um, suddenly got reflected by journalists who went out to the to the front and covered those wars and brought those messages back. But those were those were filmed broadcasts and they broadcasted once. Uh, now, Adrian. You know, if you think about the educational mission of an organization like uh, ASU, where you're housed, right? You combine that to with with John's point, with Chris's point, and you have this ability to engage over time and really deepen uh, your exploration of different topics. Um, how do you see uh, your future? We'll give you the last word. Uh, we're cut, we're at the end of our time. In fact, we've exceeded our time. So uh, um, let's let's let you uh, lead us out, Adrian. I'll, I'll keep it very brief. Um, we've, we've touched on trust, we've trust, touched on data and analytics, but I think at Arizona PBS, um, and I think I speak for public media as a whole, education is also very much so a key. It's a very key part of the public media mission, and it is a key part of what we do at Arizona PBS, um, because that way we are able to be um, in the podcast world, in the digital world, we're able to be in the classroom, we're able to be on the television. Um, and so for me, it, it is also, it's about trust and it's about intentionality, but it is also about education and educating um, our state citizens and our, and our community, our fellow community citizens. So uh, with that, Mark, I appreciate you allowing us the time to really talk about where public media is and where we see ourselves um, in the long term. And to Chris's earlier point, we've got a robust network that we know uh, will be around for many, many years to come because we're, we're evolving. Well, you and your, your staffs, your business folks, your content creators, your editors, your interns are really our uh, inspiration. We created this program out of uh, a study of what you do. So thank you so much for sharing your work uh, with us. Uh, we're trying to be part of that public media picture as well. And, and thanks for sharing your insights with us all. That's the Nonprofit Report. Everyone stay, stay safe and healthy. And, and thank you guests, thank you attendees for your questions. Take care. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Bye, Mary. thank you.